The reading this morning is taken from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 24. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. I was thinking the other day that it just seemed like over a very short period of time, a number of people, Christians, came to me to talk about some personal struggles that they had. And one of the things that really came through was that in our humanity, we find some things about being a Christian very difficult, very challenging. We want to think for a bit this morning about something that was written by the Apostle John. And think about John as we begin. John is one of the 12 apostles, but he's one of those who's closest to Jesus. We refer to a, an inner circle, Peter, Andrew, James, John, that are with him at times that the others are not. But even of those four, John is identified as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He seems to have had a very special place in Jesus' heart. And I think we're kind of a little amazed by that uh, because we think of Jesus as being very impartial and very open to all of his followers. But we realize sometimes people connect in very special ways, uh, ways that others may not find. What we know about John from history is that of the 12, he's the one who lived to old age. Most of the others died as martyrs at some point in their lives. Uh, John appears to have lived uh, to even what we would consider to be old age, which is really interesting. Uh, and we attribute, and I realize that I should have said five New Testament books uh, to John. We have the Gospel of John, which reveals a very much deeper uh, sense of who Jesus was. And then we have the three letters, first and second, third John, and we have the book of Revelation. And as you look at those, uh, you think especially about what comes through. Uh, we see it in his, in his gospel, but especially in first John, we see a, a great compassion. Well, you know, you think about it, uh, a person, a Christian, who reaches maturity and age should become a person uh, of wisdom, of compassion and love, uh, just a, a great strength for the church. And John appears to have filled that role. 
So in writing 1 John, we see some, I think, really important things. Now, our challenges as Christians are the fact that, number one, we have high ideals. You know, we think about statements like Jesus saying, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we all get a nervous breakdown, right? Because we know I'm not about, I can't be as perfect as God. But we realize that that's the incentive, that's the direction that Jesus wants us to go. But the reality is, is we're flawed. We're imperfect. We don't always make the right choices. We get into the heat of the moment. We lose our, our cool. We say things that we shouldn't. And then we feel really, really bad. We, we give in to some of our personal weaknesses. And we think, what's the point? And so... Many Christians wind up struggling with issues related to their conscience. You know, we, we feel like, you know, and I, I talk about it in other senses, but I, I, I think it's really interesting to think about what's called the imposter syndrome. And it talks about how uh, very highly successful, very accomplished people, if, if somebody talks to them privately, will say, I really didn't deserve this. You know, I, I am not that special. You know, that all of the attention and all of the uh, recognition that I've gotten uh, just really shouldn't have come to me. You know, they, they feel like they're imposters. And sometimes as Christians, we may feel, okay, well, we have this high standard we're trying to live for, but maybe... I'm an imposter. Maybe I'm just a, a poser. And so we live with a feeling and fear of spiritual failure. Sometimes it's the fear that somebody's going to discover what we really are. And the reality is, is we're no different from them. We're all the same. And those feelings that we have that are making us inadequate are part of our common humanity. But we wrestle with our doubts. We're just not sure. So, 1 John, John's first letter, is to me one of the great classics in the New Testament. Because John knows our tendencies. He knows how we feel. He knows how we think. You know, all those years of his life and all that experience, both what he has done personally, because he can think back to when he was just beginning to follow Jesus and the mistakes he made. John is not one who wants to climb all over people who make a mistake. He wants to find a way to try to help them. So on one hand, some Christians have the, the tendency of, I call it overconfidence. You know, oh, I don't have any sin. I'm perfect. Really? Chapter 1, John says, if we say we have no sin, we lie. Don't practice the truth. We're deceiving ourselves. Paul said it. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. That's our common humanity. That's why Jesus needed to come into the world. But the other side of it is the tendency for that self-criticism. That nagging voice that says, I'm not perfect. And as I look at this letter that John wrote, I think that John had in mind, and the Holy Spirit speaking through John, had in mind the fact that God's people need assurance 
We need to know that the struggle that we're facing is not in vain. It's not empty. It's not pointless. And I think that's evidenced by John saying here in chapter 3, the idea of, of when or whenever our hearts condemn us. You know, that little thing of conscience is sometimes the, the hardest criticism to deal with. You know, if somebody else criticizes us, we just get a little indignant, right? If it's a person that's really close, we might find ourselves feeling a um, little pain. But to have that voice of conscience just eating away. Somebody defined conscience as a triangular thing inside of us that starts spinning when we feel we've done wrong. And if you start thinking about what something triangular shaped spinning, you realize that it just those edges are going to keep just biting in. It's incredibly uncomfortable. Have you ever had the experience you've gone to bed, lay down at night, you close your eyes to try to go to sleep, and something you did that day that you shouldn't have, a word that you said just kind of gnaws away, and you think, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And it just goes, and it goes. So, John has this goal of building us up. And there are statements that he makes. One that he makes that, I, that is just absolutely wonderful. He gives a, state, a stated purpose for his book. I'm writing these things so that you may know you have eternal life. You know, so often we reduce that to say, well, I hope I do. John's got more confidence than we do. I'm writing this that you may know you have eternal life. So chapter 1 begins. He says, we have fellowship with God. You know, writing this thing, you may have fellowship with God. Have fellowship with us. That if we have fellowship with one another, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. I have fun with that passage sometimes talking with people. You just kind of ask as you read that verse, all right, how much of our sin does Jesus forgive? And often I get back a, all. Not a very assured statement. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all, every sin. What's left? Nothing. It's a complete and total removal of everything that stands between us and God. John kind of thinks like a lawyer here because, you know, on the one hand, he's made the statement that we mentioned a minute ago that if we say we have no sin, we lie, do not practice the truth. But now he comes down to say, but if anyone sins, all of us, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You know, our mental image of Jesus so often is that he's the prosecuting attorney accusing us. You know, that's Satan's job. That's not Jesus' job. Jesus is the one who is our defense attorney. He is our advocate before God, interceding for us. Do you get the sense of how strongly John wants Christians to understand the position that God has given to us? 
And so chapter 3 begins with this statement that, that, that God has showed his love for us in we are called the children of God. And we all know how special our children are, right? There's nothing like taking our arms and wrapping them around our kids, even if they're six foot two. Because they're special. And so the designation for us as being God's children, you know, is part of that, that assurance that John wants us to have. So, chapter 3. The first part of the chapter is, and we didn't, that was not part of our reading, but it's what, what I would call, John talks about growing toward Christ. That we want to become, and we are becoming, more like him. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. But as a Christian, through the course of my life, I get to see Jesus being formed in me and me becoming more like him. It's still imperfect. But that means that my desire is not to keep on sinning. We're caught in this. This is where our frustration comes from. We're caught in this reality. On one hand, we have this idea of, of we don't want to keep on sinning. And on the other hand, we have, but we do. We're still sinning. We're still imperfect. But that's why John's writing this, because we don't want to get hang up in that middle neutral. We want to understand what he has for us. And so, as a beginning point, we do what's right. You know, that's the test for so many things, so many choices that we make. What is right? What is good to do in this situation? And so next, he moves into the point of saying that as God's children, we love each other. He begins by talking about Cain and Abel. And he even makes the statement that whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Isn't that? That's powerful. But that's telling us that we really do need to get a handle on the anger and the bitterness and the hatred that human beings sometimes experience toward other people. Yeah, if we are living a life of hate and anger, seeking revenge, we have a problem. We should feel insecure because we're not acting like the children of God. But John really is not as much concerned with them as he is with those who are. And so love means an active demonstration of love. Not just, he, he, you notice that he says, not just in word and tongue. Talk is cheap. Saying, I love you, can be absolutely meaningless if our actions don't communicate that. And specifically, John brings it down to compassion or pity toward other of our brothers and our sisters who lack things. And in very much like James, he brings us down to a very practical thing, you know, how can you love your brother, you know, if, if you don't have compassion for him? You know, the way James puts it is, how can you say you love God whom you have not seen when you don't love your brother whom you have seen? You know, and, and so you kind of get really a very important idea here is that 
is that really one of the most important proofs of our Christianity is our treatment of one another. And so John tells us that Jesus modeled love by giving up his life for us. You know, I always think of the passage that says, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus said that. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So we show love and compassion, according to John, by sharing. If a brother or sister has need, and we have the means to help that. Now, how, how can a member of the family of God close their heart toward the need of another brother or sister? See, that's, that's his point. And what's interesting here is that John says in this, and the way we show compassion and love toward one another, we set our hearts at rest. I don't think he's suggesting a guilt motivation to, to make peace with our conscience. I think he's talking about an attitude adjustment of how we see each other and how we express our love for God by the way we express it to each other. But some of the most phenomenal words in this passage in, in 1 John 3 come from a, something that, that John points out. Now, we tend to see our weakness and failure, our, our imperfection. You know, and that's why John talks about the idea that our, that our, our hearts condemning us you know, that little nagging voice of conscience, you're a failure, you blew it, you're wrong, you're a sinner, you're... But our salvation is not based on our abilities. It's not based on our perfection. See, John makes the point here that Jesus died for our sins. In fact, that's the recurring point through this whole little letter. Christ died for our sins. And so when our hearts condemn us, he says, God is greater than our hearts. That nagging voice that keeps coming at us, God's greater than that voice. The power of the blood of Christ, of the cross, offers us the eternal life. That's why John can say, I'm writing this so that you may know you have eternal life. Because Satan is going to sow doubt. Satan's going to try to tie us up in knots with our conscience. Because we're trusting in ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I have to admit that I am not worthy of my own trust. You? But God is greater than me. Infinitely. His love is more powerful. His grace can encompass everything I've ever done. And so the hope that I have is based not on overcoming that voice of conscience. That hope I have comes from what Jesus did on the cross. I'm unworthy. 
I am weak. I am powerless. Sometimes, you know, and, and the 12-step programs say, we realized we were powerless to change. Yeah. But God has the power. God has the cross. God is the one who's greater than our hearts. Let's stand as we sing our closing song.